Good, Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to another Explore Bible study. Oh. Praise God. Oh. Well. Yeah. 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 Yes. We are. We are working our way through Matthew chapter 8. Oh, chapter 8. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Praise God. In fact, we're working our way through Matthew's Gospel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your son Jesus. And Lord, we thank you for this opportunity once again to come together and to study your word, Lord, to go deeper into your word, Father. And Lord, we just pray once again that you help us, Father, to grow in the knowledge of who you are and the understanding of what you've done for us. To see Jesus in a fresh way, Lord. Lord, to encounter him in the scriptures. And we just pray, Holy One, that you would guide us on that journey we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord. Amen. So, we're in Matthew chapter 8. Just a quick recap. Yes. So, do you remember we were talking about um, the centurion in Capernaum? Jesus is in Capernaum. You remember this show yeah, as well? Yeah. yeah. For those of you that haven't been to Israel... You're looking yeah. at Capernaum, you're looking at the synagogue. You can see the base, the foundation is from the first century. <coughs> so from the time of Jesus, this is from the 5th century Byzantine period. Okay, but that is the actual synagogue. The próxima casa do Exactly. Yes. Next, near to the house of Peter's mother-in-law that we're going to talk about shortly. So, um, so, so yeah, so Jesus is in Capernaum. This is where he does the miracle. Remember when he, he heals the guy with the withered hand and also the, dem the, the, the demon possessed person yeah. that comes in. Yeah. Um, so this is the actual place. When you're, when you're in that place and then suddenly it dawns upon you that you're standing in the exact location. That's, there are places in Israel that's debatable, right? Mm -hmm. But this place isn't. This is Capernaum and this is the synagogue mm -hmm. of Capernaum. So that, that just to just to whet your appetite if you haven't been to Israel yet, eventually you will come to Israel. Amen. So we talked about the centurion. So the centurion was aware of the difficulty for Jews entering the house of a Gentile. He says, I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof. I'm not worthy. Wow. Says a lot about him. He didn't expect Jesus to go to his house, but he trusted his word would be enough. He trusted in his authority. And uh, Jesus was, was amazed at the faith of this centurion. So the centurion understood the principle of authority and trusted in the authoritative word of Jesus. Jesus was amazed by him. Now, if I'm not wrong, this is the only time, I think, where Jesus is amazed at someone's faith. Happened to be a centurion. Okay? So many Gentiles will be found in the kingdom because the condition of the entry into the kingdom is faith. And remember, that was like revolutionary, right? Now, Galatians 3 26 29 makes it very clear that we are all sons of Abraham through faith yeah. in Jesus Christ. Um, many of us were not Jewish, mm -hmm. all right, but we've been engrafted, praise God. We who were afar, you know, we've been brought near by the blood of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Praise God. We're inheritors of the promises. Mm -hmm. Bless the Lord. So we left it there. So let's move into the next part, which is Matthew chapter 8. And we'll just read from verse 14. Yes. And I'll read... Through to 17, okay? Matthew 8, 14 to 17. 
Now when Jesus had come into Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother lying sick with a fever. So he touched her hand, and the fever left her. And she arose and served them. When evening had come, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed. And he cast out the spirits with a word, and healed all who were sick. That it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, He himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. And so, remember we said last time that Matthew, who's Matthew writing to? Remember? Jews. Jews. He's writing to Jews, right? What he doesn't do, he's not concerned about chronological order. He's not interested in chronological order. In fact, you know, it's that none of them are really concerned about the chronology, about sequence of events. Okay? What he's concerned about is his themes. There are certain themes, and he's kind of bringing together the accounts of certain incidents. Now remember Matthew, do you remember who he was? Do you remember? He was a tax collector. Okay. The, the other name that we use for him? Levi. 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 Levi's. <laughs> Levi. Okay. These are not Levi's, I can assure you. <laughs> Alright. Levi. Alright. So, so you, you've got Matthew the tax collector who himself was a Jew who walked with Jesus. Now I'm going to throw a spanner in the works, so I'm going to make it a bit difficult, right? But anyway, it might shock you to know that it was probably Mark who wrote the first gospel. This is John Mark. Remember Mark? Yeah. Okay. Now the thing is, Mark didn't walk with Jesus. And yet he wrote the first gospel, supposedly. That Matthew would have used... To, to form his own gospel. Now you ask yourself, why? Why would he do that? I don't know. I don't know, to be honest with you. But the, 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 the scholars that deal with all of this believe that Mark, and there was another source as well, Mark was the, the primary gospel that the others used, apart from John, they're called the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark and Luke, that they used to source their, their information not that they didn't know. Obviously, Luke didn't walk with Jesus, did he? No. Luke walked with Paul. Paul. Yeah. Okay. Mark depended on Peter yeah. for his information. Who walked with Jesus? Yeah. <coughs> but Matthew walked with Jesus. Okay. So, so anyway, that's just to throw us back in the works for you. Again, that's just that's I guess in helping him when he was laying out all of his information. You understand to. That's the source he got it from. Obviously, he, he was inspired. The words that he was writing were, were inspired. Okay, so that's important to, to remember. But so so for, for our benefit, all we need to know is that they're not too concerned about chronological sequence. That they're, they're more concerned about <coughs> presenting Jesus as the Messiah. In this particular one, right? So, like we've said, he's going to group together certain incidents, tell you about them, and there's a point to that that we'll talk about in a minute, to prove this is the Messiah. This is Jesus the Messiah, okay? So, Peter's mother-in-law. Praise God. Peter's <laughs> mother-in-law. Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> what are you laughing at? I don't know, I didn't ask you. <laughs> 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 the mother in law. Bless the Lord for mother in laws. <laughs> the Bible says she was sick, and Luke, the doctor, gives us more information. Yeah, he's more meticulous in his information. He says that she had a high fever. She was ill. Alright? Jesus, coming, uh, he'd just come from the synagogue. In Capernaum, and he walks down to the to the the, the house. I'm going to show you in a moment the, the house of Peter, and his mother-in-law was there. Obviously, goes in there, finds that she's sick, 
and the Bible says that he touches her. Now again, we think nothing of it, do we? Mm -hmm. But you know, the Talmud, okay, prohibits a person touching a member of the opposite sex, unless it's a close, close relative. All right. So again, we don't usually pick up on these things, do we? We don't see them. But when you start to understand a little bit more about the culture and the thinking of the time, you see that he, again, he's breaking down those paradigms, isn't it? So he touches that. S similar to what he did with the leper. Remember with the leper. Mm. The person suffering with leprosy. And we talked about uncleanness and how that could be transmitted by touch. Even if you came into contact with a dead body, mm. you know, and you, you touched a dead body, you were unclean. I think it was for seven days, if I'm not wrong. Mm. Do you know, it was very serious. Anyway, Jesus comes and he touches this sick woman. And of course, the Bible says she's healed instantly. Instantly, the fever leaves her. Bless the Lord. Mm. Bless the Lord. Let's get, just read, read back into the, the text. Where are we? I just need to get my eyes focused again, just a second. So it says, she was lying sick with a fever, so he touched her hand, and the fever left her instantly, right? And she arose and served them. You got your first deaconess, all right? She gets up and she starts to serve them. What a Sabbath this was. Wow. Praise God. When evening had come, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed, and he cast out the spirits with a word, and healed all who were sick. So again, you can imagine, they have to wait until evening. Why do you think they have to wait till evening? Don't answer John. <laughs> I know you know. Why wait till evening? Did they not want anyone else to see them? Maybe. Maybe. There's something a little bit, mm. a bit more specific. Well, that tell <laughs> so after a certain time, they're not allowed to do certain There we go. There we go. So you, during the it's Sabbath, yeah. you're limited to what you can do, right? If you've got to carry burdens, for example, carrying things, carrying people even. Okay? So when evening comes, remember Sabbath is from Friday when sun goes down, 6 o'clock, yeah. until Saturday, 6 o'clock. And then it's working week again. Even till today, Sunday is the first day of the week. Okay? In, in Israel, Sunday is a working day for the Jew. So anyway, it's Sabbath. They wait until evening. They wait until the sun's gone down and then... You know, they all, they all turn up at the Peter's house and um, it says the same evening many brought people who were demonised and sick in body. Demonised and sick in body. It's interesting how many of them were actually demonised. They had issues with demons, right? The Bible says that Jesus spoke a word and cast out those demons. Now we're going to see later on in the chapter, we're going to see another example of this. The authority of Jesus over the demonic. And I think we've, told, we've spoken about this before, but that there is power in that name. Amen. There is power over all the demons in that name. Amen. Bless the Lord with a word. Just like the centurion says, centurion says, say a word, say a word, and I know that they'll be healed, basically, right? Paraphrased. The word... Of authority. Jesus was demonstrating his authority over the demons to start with, but also over sickness. He's just demonstrated it there over sickness. Right? That's a very important credential for the Messiah. The Messiah needs to have authority over sick people, over those who are demonized, and so on. So Jesus is demonstrating very clear. Look, I'm, I am the Messiah. I am He. I'm in your midst. I'm working amongst you. Bless the Lord. Jesus cast out the spiritual with the word and healed the sick. And then, like in, on, in other places in His Gospel, remember He points us always back to the Old Testament. 
Remember, and he's saying, look, this happened so that this might be fulfilled. All right, so again, what's he pointed to now? He says that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, he himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. Interesting how he sees the fulfillment of that taking place right there with Jesus, healing the sick. Amen. Again, Isaiah 53, because that's what he's quoting, Isaiah 53. If you go back and read the chapter of Isaiah 53, you can see, if you're open and honest, you can see it's talking about Jesus, clearly. About Jesus, right? About the Messiah. Even though, from the medieval times until today, there are those rabbis that will say, no, 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 that's not the Messiah, that's Israel. Israel is the suffering servant and so on. Israel is being spoken of in Isaiah 53. All right? But we know it's not that. It's speaking about Jesus the Messiah. It's so clear, isn't it? It is to us, yes. But I mean, if you're honest, Mom, and you read. And actually, do you know, before the medieval times, some of the early rabbis acknowledged that it was speaking about the Messiah to come. They acknowledged it was speaking about the Messiah to come. Didn't necessarily acknowledge it was Jesus of Nazareth, but they acknowledged that it was about the Messiah. Because when you read it, it's hard not to come to the conclusion that that is Jesus of Nazareth. Right? Absolutely. So he himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. And this is one of the things we've talked about. And we kind of mentioned it last week we were together. Jesus, you know, he, he comes, he's preaching the kingdom, he's preaching repentance. He's preaching that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And there are miracles taking place. You can imagine, all right, the, 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 the towns and the villages all around the Galilee. You can imagine the people. Suddenly there's this miracle working young rabbi from Nazareth, you know. And, and, and obviously, like anybody else, if that was going on, you would go looking for that miracle, wouldn't you? You would take in the, the multitudes. And, and I don't know how many hours he spent casting out demons and, and healing the sick. But he did, because that was such a big part of what his mission was about. Yeah? It was a part of what his mission was about. Let's just jump forward to Matthew chapter 11. We'll look at this another time in depth. But Matthew chapter 11. <clears throat> yes. So do you remember that John the Baptist sends his disciples to ask Jesus... You know, is it you? Or should we wait for another? Yeah? And then Jesus, it says, uh, go and tell John the Baptist verse, is it four? Verse four. Oh, yeah. Go and tell John the Baptist the things which you hear and see. The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed. Remember the leper? Yeah. The deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. So he's, he's pointing them, look, he's, he's not arguing about it. You know, he's, he's demonstrating in power, I am the Messiah. Mm. I am the one that you've been waiting for. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Sicknesses, diseases, we still have them. Don't we? Yeah. Does... Jesus healed today. Amen. Yeah. Absolutely. He heals today. Does he heal everyone today? Some of you don't look very you know. Depends on the level of faith. Ooh. <laughs> well, I suppose that's a factor as well. Yeah. Faith is a factor. He's said many times by your faith, you 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 can't deny that, can you? No, you can't. Faith is definitely a factor, but is it the be or is it the determining factor? That's the thing. You know, because you, you know, I'm sure you know people as well who have, they've had the faith to refuse medicines and so on, you know, to, to, to be, God's going to heal them, they've declared it publicly and so on, and then they've died. You know, that's happened too, too, too often. However, it doesn't mean to say Jesus doesn't heal today. It absolutely does. What I think, and I've said this to you before, with, with, with healing, 
If we think about healing now as a foretaste, as a foretaste of what is to come. Mm -hmm. Okay, one day, obviously when we are in our glorified, resurrected bodies, there will be no more sickness, no more disease, mm -hmm. no more infirmity, defects, all these things will be a thing of the past. But ask yourself this question, right? So even people who are healed today, let's say they get healed of a cancer or, or, I don't know, anything, any kind of serious disease, they still die. <laughs> Do you understand? They, they, they might get healed right now with miraculous healing, but eventually they die. We all do, unless the Lord Jesus returns for us. So we're not experiencing the fullness of everything that Jesus paid for at the, price, at the cross yet. We will do one day. We will do one day. One day we will have a body where there's no more sickness and we'll, we'll experience the fullness of what is paid for. Amen. Completely healed, never to be sick again. Amen. That's hard to think about, isn't it? It's, it's, very, it's a nice thought, but it's hard to imagine. But, but it has to happen because we haven't experienced everything yet. Yes? Praise God. I'll leave that one with you. Amen. So Matthew points to the fulfilment of Isaiah 53 verse 4. Again, when evening had come, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed, or the correct terminology is demonized. Okay? Demonized. And he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick. And I just imagine what it was like to be there on that evening when Jesus, the Nazarene, was just touching people and they were being healed instantly yeah. as demons were being cast out and all out of the place. You know? Hallelujah. The king was in town. Amen. The king was in Capernaum. Hallelujah. Well, let's see. Yeah. Yes, mate. It says, when evening came, they brought to him many who were sick and everything. Yes. Yeah. The Sabbath had finished. Yes. But previous to this, we see him healing all day. And yeah, no, yeah. And no one's questioning them, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, or anyone. But does he say they brought people to be healed to him in the multitude or not? Yes, yeah. But he's still healing on the Sabbath day. Yeah, he? he doesn't care. Oh, no. No. He doesn't care. He, like yeah. I said, he's, he's healing whoever, but yeah. they, they obviously, you know, they, they waited would, until he they would have to wait. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, okay. Sure. Cool. But yeah, you see, like the guy who was healed in the temple courts, yeah. you know, on the Sabbath. Take up your mat and walk. He yeah. takes up his mat and he walks, mm -hmm. right? And then the, the, the Pharisees yeah. see him. Oh, what are you doing? <coughs> Just like that, it was Linda. Oh, what are you doing? That's the Pharisees. <laughs> Pharisees are doing. I'm impressed. In the black country. <laughs> what are you doing? In the black country. But you know, the miracle takes place on the Sabbath, and they're more concerned about the fact that he's walking around with his mat. Anyway, yeah. praise God. So just to give you an idea, I mean that doesn't look much of like a house, does it? <laughs> Alright? That, this whole area here, this particular area, this is the house of Peter's, well Peter's house, and obviously where his mother-in-law was sick. Above it, the Roman Catholic Church did, the, did us the favour of building an octagonal church <laughs> over it. So you can go up and you can actually look down and that seems significant because of something else we're going to talk about in this chapter. We can look down into what was, you know, the, 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 the room maybe, the living room of the, the house of Peter. Mm -hmm. Alright, doesn't look like much, does it? Mm -hmm. And it's just a stone's throw away from, from the synagogue in Capernaum, remember this? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Bless the Lord. And you're asking, well, how do they know, mm -hmm. are you? Yeah. How do they know? Well, I guess, is it? Because you can watch all these programs, can't you? They say, this is this, this is this, this is this. Yeah. How, how do they know? I yeah, suppose. You know I mean? For definite? Yeah. For, for definite, for definite, you don't really mm. know. Yeah. But they did find a Byzantine cross that was um, 
somewhere, I don't know if it was etched into part of the stone or something, it was, it was dated back to the Byzantine period. Because when you want, to, when, traditionally, when the archaeologists, when they want to, to identify the, 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 the locations, they go back to, obviously, closer to the period. So you're talking 4th, 5th century, and so that, that would have been the place, that's been traditionally the place. It's the same in Kursi, we're going to talk about that later, the, the, the Gagarins. Alright, so you, you, you're depending on past generations, okay, where they worshipped and they identified it, because obviously they were closer to the period, and they had their own source of information. Okay? Anyway. The synagogue, no doubt. There's only one in Capernaum. Okay, bless the Lord. So let's continue. Everybody with us? Mm -hmm. Alright. So, Jesus has been healing the sick. And then he says this. Verse 19. And when Jesus saw great multitudes about him, he gave a command to depart to the other side. Alright, so he's on the western side of the Sea of Galilee, actually the northwestern corner of the Sea of Galilee, and he's given the, the, the command to go to the other side, which we'll talk about in a moment. Then a certain scribe came and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Then another of his disciples said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, praise be. <coughs> okay, so, he's planning to go over to the other side and then the scribe comes to him and basically says, teach I'll follow you wherever you go. I'll follow you wherever you go. Okay, really. All right. So Jesus reminds the scribe of the cost of following him. And these words, you know, they should ring in our ears as well. There's a cost to following Jesus. We don't talk about that much today, do we? There's a cost of following him. Anyway, important to note that by referring to himself as son of man, because that's clearly what he's doing here, What's he say? He says, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. So that's a very important title, Son of Man. Not just because it's speaking about his humanity, but because it's from another important passage in the Old Testament, Daniel chapter 7, 13 and 14. Anybody want to read that? Daniel chapter 7. 13 and 14. I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. And he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom. And all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which will not pass away. And his kingdom is one, which will not be destroyed. Amen. You, you, you can't misinterpret that, can you? You can see that that is very clearly referring to the messianic king, right? Clearly the Messiah. And, and don't forget, these are Jews. All right, he's, he's speaking to Jews, he's writing to Jews, you understand? Jesus is speaking to Jews at the time. Matthew's writing to Jews. Jesus is making it clear, the Son of Man, who he's speaking about himself, <coughs> he's saying basically, look, I am that, that figure. I am that person that you've read about in Daniel. Now, for us, again, we've read it, Son of Man, Son of Man. Think about the implications of that. Think about the Jew hearing those words. This man is, is identifying himself with, with the Son of Man, who the Ancient of Days gives a kingdom and dominion and all that you understand. Pretty awesome, right? 
So the Son of Man is an, a messianic title referring back to the prophet Daniel. Okay, anyway, he's obviously telling him, look, there's a price to pay. I'm an itinerant rabbi. I travel around. There are times when I have to sleep in the fields with my, with my disciples. You understand? There are times we may be sleeping in people's homes, but there are times when we're sleeping outside in the fields because the mission is more important. Count the cost. That's what he's saying. Mm -hmm. Have you thought about what it will cost you to follow me? Interesting. Okay. The second person offered to follow Jesus after burying his father. Wow. It could mean several things. But the main point is that he's after a delay. He wants to postpone following Jesus. Let's just read those words again. Then another of his disciples said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. Again, the possibilities are varied. All right, number one, which is not likely, but he's basically saying, look, my, you know, as my father, I have the responsibility to take care of my father until he dies. Mm -hmm. So whether that could be years, you know, it could have been saying that, but, but that's that's righteous thing to do, and, and, and that that is embodied within the law of Moses. You are to do that. So for Jesus to say, "I don't do it," that's that's not right. You understand? So it could be because <clears throat> what would happen is they would have a funeral. Do you remember this one? Went to Nazareth. Went to Nazareth village. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so they would they would bury the dead. In um, they would obviously just look like what happened to Jesus. They would wrap them first and prepare them, and then they put them into into a, a, like a, a, a tomb. Mm -hmm. And you see the the, the <coughs> sealed with a oh, with a stone, of course. And they'd stay there for more more or less a year. And then a year later, so you'd have this period, a year later they would come back and obviously everything had decomposed and then they would collect the bones into bone boxes, osuaries, and then carry them away and they would bury them or put them with their ancestors, yeah. their fathers. It could have been that they were in this period, okay? It doesn't really matter, okay, whatever, whatever it was. He was basically saying, look, I've got something that's more important going on. And Jesus is saying, you know, let somebody else take care of that because what I'm doing is more important than anything. Mm -hmm. Does everybody follow me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. All right. Let the dead bury their own dead. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, dear. Praise God. We are all called to count the cost before taking up the call. Again, sometimes, and, and we don't, what we've tended to do is we've tended to separate, you know, salvation from, from discipleship as if like, we've tended to emphasise one over the other. And again, that goes back to, I think, the Protestant Reformation, you know, and, and, and again, we're not teaching salvation by works, we're teaching salvation for works. Do you understand? But where there's been... Where, where, where the Protestant reformers that try to emphasize faith, justification by faith, against works so much, we've lost sight. So Martin Luther he had a problem. Martin Luther had a problem with the book of James. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so James is there saying, you know, you've got to demonstrate your faith by your works. Mm -hmm. Martin Luther's like, oh no. Why? Because that, that sounds very Roman Catholic. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? Reading, reading 16th century problems back into 1st century texts. Actually, I would suggest to you that salvation and the being saved is very much about following Jesus. That The whole point is that you turn around, you repent, you turn around, you leave your old life of sin, and then you become a disciple of Jesus Christ. And you start living your new life. As a disciple of Jesus. Amen. Praise God. Jesus is not here with us today physically, but the Holy Spirit has come. Amen. And He's still taking us on this journey of discipleship. 
<coughs> when he says count the cost, it's not going to be easy. <coughs> and you ask yourself, do we, do, you know, do we do that? We, we're kind of like, like I said before, we're so concerned about getting people to just raise your hand, mm -hmm. just accept Jesus. Come on. Do you know what I mean? But he actually is saying, look, Jesus, before anybody comes to him and starts following, he's like, it can cost. <laughs> Makes it clear. <coughs> Carry the cost. Yeah. Amen. All right. Anyway, let's go back to what he said initially. Let us cross over to the other side. Let us cross over to the other side. Okay. So, Jesus is in the northwestern corner. Capernaum. Everybody see it? Okay? And he's going to come across and he's going to come to what some know as Gergesa, some know as Gadara, and some know as, there's a third one. Gesserines? No, 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 there's, a, there's another word for it. Uh, Gennesaret? Gennesaret's on the other side. Yeah. yeah. But there was um, the plains of Gennesaret on the other side. Um, I cannot remember. There's three names, all right? Again, it's not a big deal. Is it... Uh, oh, I can't remember. Anyway. Okay, so, so we've said before that the, the Sea of Galilee is actually a lake. Mm. All right? <laughs> it's, it's about... Um, I think it's about seven miles from its widest point, east to west. And it's about 13 and a half miles from north to south. So it gives you an idea of the, the size of it. Okay. Anyway, he's travelling over. He's going to take them over to the east side of the Sea of Galilee. Why was that significant? Anybody got any ideas? Is it? I think I was thinking. To, to do with going over to the, the non-Jews, the yes. like the Catholics, so they weren't meant to mix with them. So him to go, let's go across to the other side, was completely against what they were taught to keep sure. them separate. Absolutely. The, the Decapolis, Decapolis, remember that? The ten yeah. cities. Were, there was actually one city that was on the west side of the River Jordan. The rest were all located on the east side. All right, these were all, you can't see them, there's one of them, Gergesa was one of them, but they're all, Hippos was another one, so see that. All of them were Greco-Roman cities, they were pagan cities. So, so it's, it's, it's like, you know, you're going from the light into the darkness. The darkness of the Gentile world. Yeah? It's like tr crossing over into another world. Okie dokie, so, let's just read the account. So Matthew 8, verse 23. Now when he had got into a boat, his disciples followed him. And suddenly a great tempest arose on the sea, so that the boat was covered with waves. But he was asleep. Then his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us. We are perishing. We're dying. But he said to them, Why are you fearful, O you of little faith? When he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and, the, and there was a great calm. So the men marveled, saying, Who can this be, that even the winds and the sea obey him? Wow. That would have been awesome. Mm -hmm. Terrifying, I think, as well. Now remember that these disciples were seasoned fishermen. Okay? They knew this lake very, very well. They knew the Sea of Galilee very, very well. Obviously, they were, they were well familiar with the storms. But it seems that this storm was something else. He's travelling across from Capernaum. He's travelling across to, to Gergesa on the other side into the darkness and suddenly this storm whips up. And again, if you've ever seen, I've noticed, I don't know if you remember this, Jules, in, in Israel, 
the end of the afternoon, no, no final da tarde, quando começa a agitar. Yes. Uma, at the end of the afternoon, the, 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 um, you can see the wind start to pick up, yeah. and you can see everything starts to be, become agitated on the, on the lake. All right? And, and I can imagine it's quite hard if you were, if you were r rowing or even sailing, obviously, you're depending on the winds. Mm. You depend on the winds, and then suddenly you've got these winds. That, and what, what happens is, because of the, the topography, it's, it's, it's a lake, but it's surrounded by hills, by mountains. Yeah. All right, so you may have winds coming in from the east, okay, that come down and over the Golan Heights. And then you've got, the, you've got cold winds coming in from the west, from the Mediterranean, all right, coming in. And you've got, you've got warm air rising from the, from the sea itself. And when there's a clash, you can imagine that stirs up the waves. And the, so, so it was a storm. It was a storm. And these seasoned fishermen were frightened. Why, if we go into the other accounts, in the other Gospels, and I don't have them here, but you can see the other accounts, you can see that the, the waves, the water was entering the boat. It was coming into the boat. And they were, naturally, they were panicking. Oh my goodness, you can imagine, what was Jesus doing? He was sleeping in the stern, in the rear of the boat, on a pillar. And these details are really important mm -hmm. Because they show you, we spoke about this today, they give you a glimpse of his humanity. He was exhausted. You know, he'd been ministering and teaching and everything else and he was tired. He was exhausted to the point where he was out of it on the, on the pillar and yet the, the disciples are flapping. You know, the wind's probably battering against the, 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 the boat and the, the waves are coming in and he's asleep. Wow. So Jesus was sleeping in the boat. His disciples were in turmoil because of the storm. And then Jesus stands up. What's he say? Then his disciples came to him and awoke him. I mean, how do you sleep through a storm? You must be really tired. Eh? Lord, save us. We're perishing. Save us. We're perishing. But he said to them, why are you fearful? Oh, you of little faith. No, I don't know about you. Right? But he'd have been looking at me at that. He'd have been rebuking me as well. You have little faith. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Come on. Goodness me. Anyway, what else does it say? All that's going on. Then he arose. He rebuked the winds and the sea. And there was a great calm. <coughs> Gets up. Can you imagine being in the boat? With Jesus and seeing that happen. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden you, you, you think you're going to drown. I mean it must be terrifying. Yeah. And then all of a sudden everything just returns to calm. Mm -hmm. So the men marveled. I bet they did. Mm -hmm. The men marveled. Look what they said. Saying, who can this be that even the winds and the sea obey him? Now he's demonstrated already that he's got power over sickness, right? He demonstrated he got, he's cleansed the leper, he healed the centurion's servant, and he's healed Peter's mother-in-law. Showed he's got power over sickness. Now... He's demonstrated he's got power over nature. No wonder they're asking, they're looking at him and thinking, who, who can this person be? Who can this man be? It shows you that though they were with him, they didn't fully understand who they were, they were with. Do you know what I mean? They must have listened. I mean, I wonder if they were present when he was telling the, 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 the would-be disciple, you know, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have, 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 have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Mm -hmm. I wonder if they, because surely they knew the scriptures in Daniel, you know, this, this heavenly figure. I, I think that they were like, <clears throat> that they're in a process. Yeah. And, and it's being revealed to them who he is. Mm -hmm. And we know that at one point, Peter, when he asks the disciples, who do men say that I am? 
Peter's the one that's going to say, you are the, the son of the living God. And he, and he says, you know, uh, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And he says, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for this uh, what's it? flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. It's, it's God who reveals who the Son is. Amen? Amen. So, so, wow. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Um, I heard, I was watching something and they were talking about where they say, who is this that the wind and the waves and the waves obey him? And they linked it back to Psalm 89. He said actually it's okay. a de declaration of his deity. Yeah, yeah. Psalm, it's a messianic song. Yeah, Psalm 89 9 says, you rule the raging of the sea. When the wind, when the waves rise, you still them. Wow, that's powerful. Just read that again, Joe, nice and loud. Do you want me to read the verse before as well? Yeah, go on. So it says, O Lord of hosts, who is mighty as you are, O Lord, with your faithfulness all around you, um, you rule the raging of the seas. When its wind, when its waves rise, you still them. Wow. <laughs> Amen. I've not seen that before, by the way. So that's a good that's connection, good. isn't it? That. Yeah. Thinking back to Psalm 89. Yeah. Can well, I ask a question as well? Sorry. Go on, right. go on, John. Yeah. So, um, would you, some say, I've heard some say that the storm was sent by God to okay. show who he is as, a, as a, the Christ and Messiah um, for the disciples to see him as he is. But some, I've heard, say that it was actually a fluke mm -hmm. or a fluke storm, okay. which I don't yeah. agree with. And others say that it was a demonic storm because, because it was a legion of demons, it was a demonic stronghold, therefore Satan or the princes of the earth <coughs> were using that to stop, try to stop him getting their stronghold. But do demons and Satan have power over nature? And if so, we you said the storm, or was it just a fluke? Sorry. No, no. <laughs> You're going to talk about this after in the uh, discussion period. I'm sorry. I'm very no, it, no, sorry. no, not, not, not at all. Sorry. I think in the video I watched, it might have alluded to that. I've always been told it was it a might. demonic wind. I've heard that. I've heard that. Obviously, try, Jesus is coming across to the to the Decapolis and, mm -hmm. yeah. and territorial spirits and everything. I just think I think we need to be careful yeah, about affirming those things mm -hmm. because a lot of it's you know you know you you you, you, you guessing that it's, that's the reason. We don't we're not we're not explained or it's not explained, and so maybe maybe. Yeah, maybe. It's one I of think them. Michelle asked that question. Yes. That would be real. You know, you ask. You do, don't you? You ask. And the other thing, I mean, I, I could, I could accept that as, you know, like the devils or whatever, the, the demons and the, the legion and the territory they're going into, and it was an attempt to try and stop them coming into the region or whatever. I just, I don't know exactly. We can't affirm it, can we? No. If it's not written, we can't affirm it. Or could you say that God sent it as a proof that it was his son? You could say that too, couldn't you? And you could say it was a fluke. Or you could say it was just like, you know, it was just a terrible storm that took place. Well, yeah. the actual thing, he can't. He can't, yeah. yeah. That's the point, that's isn't it? That's the point, yeah. That's yeah. yeah. No matter how, why, how it came. He, yes. He's still like, he's got the authority over it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. To stop Absolutely. it, whether it was sent yeah, you can ask Pastor Zhu later. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he says, I didn't even understand the question. No, that person tells somebody, qual foi a causa da tempestade? Se foi, poderia ter sido os demônios, poderia ter sido uma coisa natural. Quem sabe, né? Poderia ser Deus para mostrar quem é Jesus. Não se acorde. Amen. Anyway, so Jesus rebuked the disciples, <coughs> then rebukes the storm. <laughs> All right. Demonstrated his, his authority over nature. And again, that's a good connection with Psalm 89. Yeah, that's the disciples wondered who this man truly was. I bet they did, and I would have done as well. Praise God. Just to encourage you, again, 
You know I'm going to whet your appetite. Eventually you're going to get there, Jane. <coughs> so, so, those of you who have been, who have not been, I don't know if you saw this, I took you to see this. This is what they call the Jesus boat, right? So, in 1986, yeah, he's getting his, uh, his rice <laughs> 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 that's it, that's it. Yeah, that's, 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 that, that's not the one. That's not the one. Yeah. That's Magdala, that's the pulpit at Magdala. Yeah, but it's like that's, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's the, the shape of it. Yeah. So in 1986, right, there was uh, there was there was drought conditions, and the waters of the Galilee receded to the point where I think two people were walking by the edge of the Galilee, and they saw the this boat, okay, and. Uh, when they called in the Antiquities Authority, the first challenge was how to remove it from all the silt and everything else mm -hmm. without breaking it, without it breaking up. And so they actually, they managed to cover it in the end. They managed to cover it. They couldn't lift it. <coughs> they, they, they would have to float it. So they covered it in a, in a, in a is it polythyrene? Would that be the right substance? Mm. It created like a foam casing. Mm -hmm around it and so they actually they, they, they then were able to float it on the Sea of Galilee mm -hmm. when they dated it it was from the first century from the time of Jesus mm -hmm. so for the first time in 2000 years it was being floated on the Sea of Galilee mm -hmm. and they floated it to a, a kibbutz mm -hmm. and it's still there today they've prepared a room for it you can go and visit it and so it gave the archaeologists an idea of the structure of the fishing boats at the time. And if you look at later, if you're interested, my dad can show you. <laughs> but that's in Magdala, and that's a pulpit that they built in the shape, in the form of the boat. So it's been, it's been nicknamed the Jesus boat. Obviously, there's no evidence to say that that was Jesus' boat, or, but it was certainly from that time. What it tells you here, Robert, is that it said that the boat chapel. This yeah. chapel commemorates Jesus preaching from the boat. The altar boat stands <coughs> over the first century port. Yes. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. To so right. show you, that's the port. That's the port. Where was from. Yeah, yeah. Magdala was a fishing port. Yeah, absolutely, an important port. Anyway, so that's the Jesus boat. It's twenty-five past seven. I don't want to go into the next section with you yet, because we need to spend a little bit more time on it. But. You've kind of <coughs> given an idea. We're going to be talking about the the demoniac, the demon possessed men, men. Okay. So we'll talk about we'll, we'll talk about that next class. All right. Okay. Have a break. Have a kick. Out. Our vision is to be a worshiping community at the heart of Kings Winford where every home is an expression of the kingdom. And every believer a disciple of the king. Our mission is to be obedient to the Great Commission. Through the faithful proclamation of the gospel. Developing, equipping, and sending of disciples. Welcome to King's Winford Christian Centre.